Good afternoon. My name is Lena Gierke, and I'm a member of the Research Line on Human Rights and Transitional Justice at the K. Leuven Institute of Criminology. I'm extremely pleased to be joined today by Theodora Anna Mihai, who is the director of the film La Civile, a fictional film about the present day crisis of disappearances in Mexico. For those of you who have not yet seen the film, I'll give you a very brief overview. La Civile tells the story of Cielo, a mother in search of a daughter, abducted by a criminal gang in northern Mexico. As the authorities fail to offer her support in the search, Cielo takes matters into her own hands. She begins her own investigation and earns the trust and sympathy of Lamarck, an army lieutenant working in the region. He agrees to help Cielo in her search because her research data could be useful to his operations. Cielo's collaboration with Lamarck pulls her further into a vicious cycle of violence. I'm excited to be able to discuss the film and the role of fiction in the portrayal of human rights violations and atrocities with the director of this film. So thank you very much, Teodora, for joining us today and welcome. Thank you very much for your uh, interest and for inviting me. <laughs> thank you. Teodora Anna Mihai was born in Bucharest, Romania during the Ceausescu regime and moved to Belgium in 1989 with her parents. She discovered her passion for cinema while in high school in San Francisco and went on to study film in New York. Her documentary, Waiting for August, has won numerous international prizes and was nominated for the European Film Awards. La Civile is her first fiction feature and was presented last year at the Cannes Film Festival in the section Un Certain Regard, where the jury awarded it with the Audacity Prize. So to start off, Theodora, I would like you to tell us a bit about why you chose the issue of disappearances in Mexico as a subject for your film. Um, yes, I actually, um, I admit that it, it, my idea was broader. I didn't set out to really um, talk about disappearances specifically, but more about um, how it is to live. Um, well, let, let me give you a little bit of context before. Um, when I got the idea of La Civile, I was actually uh, traveling in Mexico, but I was still working on my previous uh, project, uh, Waiting for August, that was talking about children in Romania, um, uh, underage children, um, who are living a difficult uh, reality as well. But it's more of a social economic reality where the parents leave the country um, and kids often stay either with grandparents or... Um, aunts, uncles, and sometimes alone. And it's, of course, you know, parental absence is, is always a difficult, a difficult um, subject matter. But then I was traveling um, in the north of Mexico while I was working on this project. And my brain started making links between uh, the reality I was writing about and talking about and the reality I was living. And uh, I was staying with friends who told me, listen, if you want to leave the house, that's fine, but just make sure that after 7 p.m. you're back. And it just kind of hit me in the face. I'm like, okay, this is, how, how do kids grow up here? How is it to be an adolescent? How is it to be a parent um, in this kind of uh, circumstances, in this kind of context where you can leave the house and maybe not come back? Um, and so that's how, how I set out uh, making this project. And my idea was to make it out of the, well, from the point of view of the children. Um, that's how I started. My interviews were mostly with uh, young, younger people. And it was um, coincidentally almost that I met a mother uh, and my, my research took a completely different turn. Um, I met a mother who um, was searching for her disappeared daughter, had been uh, kidnapped by a local cartel, and she, you know, found it necessary to take matters into her own hand because she wasn't getting help uh, anywhere. So um, when she told me a phrase that for me really made the click, um, she told me, when I wake up in the morning, I want to kill or die. Um, that's how I feel every morning. And that sentence was like, okay, this person has, has a story that should be told. Um, and yeah, that's how we started working together. And I started uh, meeting 
more mothers, uh, more not only mothers, of course, family family members, fathers, uncles, uh, grandparents, sometimes um, people looking for for their family. And disappearances and violence more generally are not a matter of the past in Mexico, but are really some problems that are ongoing. Did you have any difficulties while making the film about a situation that is ongoing? And if so, what type of difficult difficulties did you face? Yes, I mean, uh, the security has been, uh, I mean, has been an issue or uh, something to, to be careful uh, about from the beginning, from the investigation part. Um, I was going to schools sometimes in, in, in uniform uh, as like a social assistant or I was trying to pass for someone else just uh, so that I wouldn't um, attract too much attention to myself and to the subjects uh, that I was trying to investigate. So I really uh, did my best to keep a low profile. Of course, uh, it's a good try, but, but you know, you end, I ended up... Um, attracting attention at times uh, and, you know, thinking back uh, upon it, I realized that uh, we did take risks um, uh, with my, with my crew and we did take risks, but I guess um, we uh, had a good star and, you know, nothing too bad happened, but it, it was a risk. And then, um, starting the idea was to make a documentary so i started working with this um uh, lady the mother who uh who told me i want to kill or die um i was like please let me uh, follow you in your daily life and in your daily fight um her name by the way is uh, miriam rodriguez she later on became a, a very famous uh, militant um, at the time I met her, she was she didn't really have a platform, um, so she was very very happy to collaborate. And her idea was that she wanted the story to get out of Mexico. And um, it was very interesting that the fact that I was foreign somehow for her was a was a sign that I didn't have like any uh, alliance with any cartel or any politicians. I was kind of a, a blank page for her. So she, I guess, felt freer to also being a woman, she felt freer to just uh, share. Um, of course, you, you know, I, I, uh, I did um, uh, ask my co-writer to, to um, come in and, and, and meet her and so, we uh, did the part of the investigation together, but that was the, the starting point. Um, I don't know if <laughs> I'm going off the rails <laughs> in no, your question. I think, yes, I think we can follow up with the next question then, because you said that you initially wanted to make a documentary, but then in the end, you decided to make um, a fiction film. So. What do you think is the role of fiction in portraying contexts where serious human rights violations occur? Um, well, the, the, the reason, uh, first of all, the reason why this documentary could not happen is that I started it. Uh, she agreed and we, we started working together. I followed her with a small crew during uh, two weeks. But the region she was living in was so, so complicated. Um, that we needed, we were four people in the crew, we needed four bodyguards and the bodyguards um, had asked arm, the armed forces for reinforcement. So basically we were traveling in convoy following um, this mother. And for, for me, it was a big frustration because I was so visible, we were so visible. Um, and I was trying to make an observational documentary that has to capture the intimacy, has to be very close to, to people and, and, and be very kind of fresh and, and capture things as, they, uh, as they're happening 
without being able to anticipate too much. But yeah, we were so visible that, you know, once we arrived somewhere, they were able to make a whole theater for us that was not exactly the, the, the reality that I knew I wanted to capture. It was a reality that people wanted me to capture. So you know what I, I mean. Um, and this was a big frustration for me because I didn't, you know, I didn't need censorship in that way. I was self-censoring myself for um, security reasons on one side, because I didn't want anything to happen to uh, my protagonist or to any, any one of her acquaintances' family. And uh, of course, I, have, uh, I had a responsibility towards my crew. So, so at that moment, I was like, okay, I need to rethink this. Um, and um, I realized that fiction, which was my first love really because I, I studied fiction, and I realized it was going to give me the liberty and the protection to talk about the subject matter without, um, you know, taking risks or not such big risks. In my mind, it was it. Uh, it made sense. So uh, we talked it uh, over with uh, with Miriam, and she agreed. And that's where uh, I started working with Abacuc Antonio de Rosario, uh, the co-writer. Um, we started processing all the investigation I had done uh, because the investigation was already like it was two years and a half of testimonies, uh, speaking to kids, to, to other parents, other families. And, um, and of course, the protagonist, the main character is inspired by Miriam Rodriguez. But the story is fictional. It's not, uh, many times I, I read articles that are claiming, you know, this is the story based on, it's not. Um, but it's heavily inspired by the reality that I have um, seen, I have witnessed in Mexico. And uh, bits of pieces of testimonies just got into this fictional narrative that has, is deeply rooted in, in contemporary Mexican reality. And speaking about uh, violence in Mexico, what is the main message about violence and human rights violations in the country that you want to communicate through the film? Um, well, the, the interesting part, what, what really um, caught my attention so much in, in Miriam's story is that, uh, you know, I came to, the, to realize that violence, once it touches uh, a person, it kind of drags that person in. Like it, it, it absorbs it and you become part of that violence, of that vicious cycle. Um, you know, what happens to our protagonist in, in La Civil, she starts out as a victimized mom whose uh, daughter is kidnapped. Uh, but slowly and but surely you realize that she crosses a lot of her own uh, moral boundaries or, you know, moral limits and uh, becomes an integral part of the, of the violence that made her a victim in the first place. And, and it's, it's that irony that is, is so heavy, you know, when, when the conflict becomes so personal, the walls of morality fall. And not even as a spectator can you can you judge people? Because from a from a human point of view, you can really understand the evolution. But there are so many gray gray areas, and um, yeah, that that fascinated me a lot. Uh, the fact that there is suffering on both sides in different ways. It's uh, you cannot oversimplify uh, um, things and people in good or bad. That complexity really attracted me. Um, and I never claimed to have answers. Um, the situation is so complex. And, and by the way, I'm not, I'm not a politician. I'm not a militant. I am a storyteller. I'm a narrator. And I narrate... Um, 
I choose stories that uh, I I think are relevant and that um, reached me in a in in a particular way, and I want to share that with the public. And I think that everyone's responsibility or responsibility or interpretation is like once they see the film, they can they can do whatever they need to do with it, whatever is in their power, whether it's a change of mentality or a change of law, depending on who is seeing it, you know? Um, but basically that is my contribution to the, to the subject matter. Yeah, I think that's a very interesting way of describing it and really also addressing the complexity of the situation in Mexico in general and that there's so many facets to all the um, participants, let's say, in the violence in the country. Yeah, if you, if you notice in the film, um, there is a lot, you know, one of the main themes is family. Um, Cielo is looking for her daughter. And then at, at one point, uh, one of the, the cartel members uh, is, is killed is executed and then uh, you see her sister, um, you know, going to, to look for the body at the mortuary. And, and you see this, this girl suffering because she lost her sister. That's, you know, still humanity. And then you have uh, the, the young boys, the young cartel members, and you realize, okay, they're uh, the father of someone, they're the son of someone, you know, these people didn't exactly choose for what is happening, uh, what this individual is doing, especially not the child who is still a baby. So um, then the question is, why is this? Why has this boy chosen that path? Was it a choice? Was it, um, you know, an obligation almost? Or so it's it's so complex, but. Everyone does it for their family with different agendas, with opposing agendas. But how do you get out of that when it's so, so deep and personal? Uh, during the testimonies, I realized that uh, some kids had uh, uh, close family members, uh, dads who had been killed um, by one of the gangs. And... And of course, this kid is growing up with the idea of revenge, with, with the need to make justice. What do you tell this kid? It's understandable, you know? Another, another thing that I was observing, especially uh, meeting many young people, is that uh, becoming a narco becomes like a, a, a dream job like you ask kids you know what you want to be uh, when you're when you're big and uh, they don't tell you policeman and and doctor and lawyer anymore like sometimes they will tell you oh, yeah, I want to be a, a, a narco or the girlfriend of a narco and yeah I mean it's it's very confronting but it's uh, yeah it's what it is. Indeed, yeah. And it touches on a lot of probably very structural and societal issues as well. And uh, maybe thinking about that, um, the film has received several awards last year and was shown um, not just at the festival in Cannes, but also at other film festivals, including in Mexico. And now it will actually come into commercial cinemas in Mexico this month. So. What debates would you like the film to spark uh, both in Mexican society and abroad, maybe? Well, um, of course, I, I think the subject matter has to has to be debated because it's a very heavy reality to grow up in, to live in. Uh, I think nobody should uh, be obliged to negotiate with violence on a daily basis in that way and live with the uncertainty of tomorrow in a very existential way. Am I going to be alive or not? You know, um, something needs to happen. Uh, and, and it can only happen when people don't shove it under the rug, but actually continue 
to brainstorm about it, continue to address it um, and address it in a, in a better way because the situation is, is very heavy and it stays. Unfortunately, you know, this film was, uh, I, I've worked for seven years on it and it's still timely. And that is the scary part, you know? People are still disappearing on a daily basis and not one, but many, yeah. Well, and on that note, and with that in mind, uh, I hope that the film will be well received by the Mexican audience and spark these really crucial debates. And I would really like to thank you again, Teodora, for taking the time to discuss the film. Um, it's incredibly interesting to incorporate artistic perspectives into our discussions about human rights violations. So I really appreciate your openness to participate in this. And I look forward to hearing more about the film's reception and uh, for staying in touch and discussing these matters further. So, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>